Hey, what's up? This is TJ. Thanks again for joining me. This is my deep dive video on the GS Music E7 7 voice analog polysynth. It's going to be a deep dive video. We're going to look into all the different architecture of the synth, listen to the oscillators, the filters, all the nitty gritty stuff. I'm going to give you my pros and cons of the synth. We're going to get a really good look and see what it can, it can do. If you're looking for sounds, well, this is not really the video for you. You need to check out the video that I just made yesterday. Um, that has the first look sounds that I gotten out of it and also I'm probably going to post another video of sounds that I create uh, over the next few days. So check that out. Make sure you hit the bell, subscribe, all that good stuff. Without further ado, let's get started. All right, here we are with the GS Music E7 7 Voices of Analog polyphonic synthesis oh man this thing is so nice it's huge really i mean it's like three keyboard octave wide uh it's really really big it's made silently it's made of metal wood the knobs are very very solid they're all panel mounted knobs okay you know, on the back here you've got a power switch you've got a power input uh that is a Woolworth style You've got USB in, out, through of MIDI. You've got three CV uh, inputs, those being for the pitch, for the uh, filter, and for the gain. There's an external input that goes right to the mixer. Um, it goes right to here. When you plug that in there, it takes the place of the noise. And then you have stereo outputs, and you have headphone output. Um, really well made. Really am glad to see, you know, that synthesizers are being made like this and it is at a very attractive price which we'll talk about a little bit later looking at the front panel everything's laid out really really nicely it is an old style classic type of synthesizer not your modern style synth it's more of your classic type more hands-on type of synthesizer very little menu diving very little menu diving excuse me uh you know associated with it we're going to start out here with the oscillators and you have two oscillators that are basically the same and they have different waveforms they have four different waveforms and you have the ability to blend some waveforms so let's take a look at oscillator one you have a triangle wave let's take a look let's listen to that your classic triangle then you have a saw triangle And your pure sawtooth. Alright, you turn those off and then you turn on the pulse wave, the square wave, with a variable pulse width, which obviously you can send that to be modified either through envelope one or through the LFO. Let's listen through the LFO here. So that's very, very nice. We'll turn that down. Then you have the ability to blend the waves. Okay, so you can blend the pulse wave with the triangle. Okay, and then if you add the pulse width to that. You turn this down so they don't get too distorted. Okay, then you can do the saw triangle pulse. And then the pure sawtooth with the pulse. So very, very nice. We're gonna leave that just on the sawtooth. Okay, that is just oscillator number one. Oscillator one and two are almost exactly the same. The only difference between the two is this button here. On oscillator one, if hit the shift button, you'll note that that is a latch, not a monetary shift, momentary shift. If you hit the shift button and you hit the one here button here, in oscillator one, you'll get the auto tune. 
and that takes only about a second or less so that's very really cool if you hit it here in oscillator 2 it is the oscillator sync so very very cool we'll turn that off okay and going in deeply into the operators here, if you had the shift button on again, and you do that, you can transpose by a semitone. Up 24 and down 24. Okay, you turn the shift button off. Okay, you can have a fine tune plus or minus a half a cent. Okay, in terms of modulations, you can send the pitch for the destination of either LFO1, LFO2, uh, Envelope1, or LFO3. So let's just say, for example, we use LFO1 again, as we did before. And just for fun, if we crank up the LFO1, you'll see that goes all the way up to audio rate up to 100 hertz. All right, we'll put it back down to, you know, scary movie speed. <laughs> All right, turn that off. Again, that goes to either LFO1 or LFO2, envelope one or envelope, excuse me, LFO number three. Um, let's add in the second oscillator here. And you'll see it's great with the display. It actually has the numbers in here. It might be hard to see on the video, but it does have the numbers very small of what the amounts are. And Moving on to the mixer, you'll see that it also has a sub. Subs are square waves, and there's a sub per oscillator. Turn all those down, you can hear the noise. And that's the sound that's in my head most times. <laughs> All right, let's just play around and detune some of the oscillators and see what that sounds like. Okay, let's turn that down a little bit. You can drive the mixer to get some distortion. So let's turn the main alpha out and we'll drive the mixer. So that's a very classic style mixer sound. Add a little bit of sub. And you can get a big sound out of that. All right, let me uh, just listen to oscillator one here. We're gonna turn these all down here. Turn the pitch back to zero. And just so I don't forget, I'll turn that at zero as well. So you have one here. Let's move on to the filter. So we're listening to oscillator one just through the filter here. Let's sweep that. Turn that up a little bit for you. A little bit louder. All right, and let's turn off the resonance so you can hear that. It is a classic uh, 24 dB ladder style filter. It does drop the bass a little bit when you raise the resonance. And you can actually see that doing that in the display. It will uh, self resonate if you turn the resonance all the way up for a sine wave. 
Okay, I'll turn that down. All right. And you have your envelope one mod here. It is positive only. Let's uh, use that a little bit. All right, we'll talk about the envelopes a little bit more in a bit. So I'm gonna turn that back. Uh, the LFO one. Okay. Um, you can set the keyboard tracking. Great uh, visual representation of that. Something I really like. Um, and you can assign it to the mod wheel, to the aftertouch. Uh, you can assign it to LFO3 for a destination and a source and destination, excuse me. Let's assign it here to LFO3. If I hit the shift here again, okay, and I turn this up. All right, and I got to turn it up over here. Turn up the rate. And then off camera, I'm going to use the mod wheel. Here we go. Oops, I had the after touch up. Turn it up for the mod wheel. There we go. And you'll just notice a little quirk that what I did, just to get off topic just for one second, is the shift button is a latch. It's not a monetary. So sometimes I forget, you know, that it's on. So in that case, when I turned this up, it was actually turning up the after touch. It wasn't turning up the mod wheel because I forgot to turn it off. But if you have it on the aftertouch here, I'm going to again use the keyboard for that. That's a keyboard I have off camera here. Okay. I don't want to use the keyboard for his because the aftertouch on this is very, very sensitive and uh, it won't go off very, very easily. All right. Uh, let's turn that down here and turn that down as well. Um, even though it is a little bit confusing with the shift button, you do have some very good representation within the screen, so you know what you should be looking at. All right, you turn that here and turn that off. Okay, <laughs> next we're going to move over to the amp section. Okay, you have the ability again to use LFO1 to affect that. <laughs> Or again, LFO2 or 3. Okay, and also here you have the keyboard tracking. Dead center is even. All right, and you have the ability to set the amount of envelope 2 to be the modification for that. Um, with the shift functions here, you have the ability to set the stereo spread as well as stereo motion, which is his own fixed rate LFO. So that's the spread. So each voice will have its own uh, stereo spread. All right. I'm going to turn that off here and I'm going to go to the stereo motion. Let's turn that up here. And you'll see in the display it moves. So. And these two are independent, are dependent upon each other, excuse me. So if I turn this over here. Yo 
you'll get lots of stereo types of panning type of effects. So I'm going to turn that back to the center. Turn that down here. Okay. Next, we're going to move over to the envelopes. Okay, everybody wants to hear whether or not they're nice and snappy, and they are. So let's route it to the filter here first. <laughs> So that's with no uh, envelope one effect. Turn it all the way up. Turn the filter down. Turn the resonance up so you can hear it. So the envelopes have a nice uh, snappy effect to them. Let's uh, turn this up here, turn that down, down, turn this all the way up so you can hear the amplitude. So the filters are nice, they have a nice snappy sound to them. They are digitally controlled uh, envelopes, okay? Um, I should say the envelopes were snappy, not the filters. The digitally controlled envelopes, okay, as well as the LFOs are digitally controlled. But all of the actual uh, path of audio is still analog, which moves me to the coarse and delay effects. The dry signal is still analog, but the wet signal is a digital chorus and digital delay. So let's hear uh, the chorus here. There are two different types, okay? That's the basic type. You have to hit the shift button again for that. And if you go to the assemble type, gets more crazy, kind of has a like a Juno-esque kind of sound. Obviously a dimension, type of chorus effect. Again, if you turn the mix all the way down, you turn the chorus off, you see the light that goes off, and then the path is pure analog. Because it's all just a dry signal. Let's listen to some delay here. We'll turn that up. delay time of 1.3 seconds 1.34 uh, according to the display here so it's a nice effect and the course and delay really work well together nice within the synth it has a nice chorus and delay if you don't like it you can always obviously turn it off and use your external effects all right let's turn these off for now and next i want to talk about this section here this is the modes for all of your voices okay you've been listening to the seven voices of polyphony here but there are different modes okay we can hit the next mode which is the classic 
mono mode. All right, so there's two different types of mono modes. There's the monophonic signal trigger, which is essentially a legato type mode. All right, so I need to mess with the envelope so you can hear that. And let's see. So you can hear the envelopes do not re-trigger in that mode when you play legato. Then there is the multi-trigger monophonic mode where it will re-trigger each time. No matter how much you do that, there is a unison single trigger mode. So let's go to that next. This is gonna be really cool and loud. <laughs> All those seven voices gorgeously all together. And again, there is a unison multi-trigger mode. Okay, again, the single trigger is when you play legato, it won't reset the envelopes. The multi-trigger will trigger the envelopes every time. <laughs> Okay, so those are the different modes. The polyphonic mode is always a trigger mode. There's no polyphonic legato type mode. All right, so we want to go back to the LFOs. We hadn't talked about those yet. There are three LFOs, LFO1, LFO2, and LFO3. LFO1 and LFO2 are exactly the same. They have five different wave shapes. LFO3 has four different wave shapes. The only thing that's missing on LFO3 in terms of wave shapes is the noise sample and hole. Um, each one of the wave shapes has different modes. You want to hit the shift button again and you'll see the different modes. Okay, that's monophonic. That's a global for that. Let's, uh, let's route that here too. Right, let's mess this up. Put this back to where it was. Da, 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 so you can hear it okay and we'll again take that to the pitch so no matter how many voices i play it's always going to be the same sync in terms of the different uh, global uh, LFO. Alright, so I'll come back here. Whoops. And there we go. And I put that back on monophonic. So it is global. If you hit it again while the shift button is on, you have the polyphonic. So each one of the uh, waves is going to re trigger, okay, at the time of which you know, you hit the key. So each one has a re-trigger. There is a couple other modes. Uh, the keyboard tracking is really, really cool. Not many synthesizers have this. It basically depends on where you play the key. So if you have it at a low key, you're going to have a very low rate. If you play a high key, it's going to have a high rate. So yeah, as you play down the scale, it's going to change the speed of the LFO. And then you have a keyboard sync mode, which changes the phase of the LFO depending upon uh, where you are playing in the keys that you're playing in. So the lower the key you're playing in is going to play in a certain phase. The higher the key that you play, the higher the uh, space in the phase is in terms of uh, the percentage of phase that you started out with. So basically what that means is that as you play, each key is going to have a different phase of LFO where its start point is. And you have a clock sync. So it syncs to external clock. And then you have both the keyboard and clock sync at the same time, which is cool. All right, so I put that back on monophonic. I take the shift off here. 
And then you can see the different LFO types. You have your basic triangle. You have your uh, ramp up, ramp down, square, and your sample and hold noise. So depending on where you have those set and the different modes, we'll determine the response of that. Let's put that back up here. I'm going to turn this down and turn this down over here so that I can talk about LFO3. LFO3 does not have, as I mentioned, the sample and hold, and it is tied to either the mod wheel or the aftertouch. Um, let's just say, for example, for the pitch, I hit shift again, you'll see LFO3 here. Okay. I hit a key. Nothing happens, right? Because I have to turn this up over here. I want to turn the shift off and then I want to turn it to, to the mod wheel. And then off camera here, I'm going to change the mod wheel. Or I can route that to aftertouch or both, but let's route it to aftertouch. Off camera here, I'm going to hit a key and then you're going to hear the aftertouch engage with LFO3. So that's how that works. All right, the last section I want to talk about here is the preset section. This is where you obviously can select your presets and you can also select the menu options, the panel mode if you want to work from panel mode, and the configurations as well as to set up the four part multi timbral mode. So, first, I want to just talk about the presets. If you want to dial up presets, you've got to actually type in the number. So, you hit the bank here, okay? You want to go to the first preset, 111. And that is your opening preset for the first the factory preset there. All right. And you don't necessarily have to dial all three numbers when you're on the same bank. If you want to go to the bank, no, the number eight on that same bank, you just hit eight and it goes to number eight. Some kind of weird preset. All right, let's go to a nice other pad. I'm a sucker for pads. So that's how you select your presets. There is no like dialing function, you know, where you can dial through the presets, say for example. You could do that with a outside controller, uh, you know, through MIDI if you want to. Um, but on there, uh, on the panel itself, within the E7, you have to dial up the preset number, okay? Next you have, uh, you know, a lot of these shift functions. So again, we hit shift here. Okay, we have first the menu functions. This allows you to set up uh, the transpose. Okay, up or down. Okay, we all know what that is. Okay, you here, number two, you can assign the voices. Okay, um, and three and four, you can copy a preset, or number four, you can copy a part. So when you're working with the multi temporal mode, we're going to talk about that in a moment. When you're working with multi temporal mode, you can actually copy a preset into that multi temporal mode. All right, we're going to skip multi temporal mode, I'm going to come back to that later. All right, next, when you all have the shift on, you hit the panel, oops, take it out of menu, hit the panel, it puts you in panel mode. So whatever the panel is showing is what your preset's gonna sound like. And that's the initial preset that we had before. So if I take the panel off, okay, shift, it should go back to the preset. Let's have to dial it up again, there we are. Okay. Turn the shift back on, we go to the configurations. This is where you can set your MIDI channel in and out. Okay, you can set whether or not it responds to pitch band, uh, pitch change, excuse me, um, program change, and or CC commands. So you can send out CC commands from the different uh, knobs and have it recorded and have it sent back. Hit the configure again. All right, you can send the destination of what type of clock that you wanted to have received from either MIDI, okay, or 
USB. This becomes a value knob for that. And you can also turn on MPE mode. So this synth has MPE mode. Not many analog polyphonic synths have MPE mode, so that's really, really great. One of the unique features of the E7. Um, MPE is wired, hardwired to the XYZ planes of X being the pitch. Y, the up and down, is the cutoff and the Z is the aftertouch. There's no way to reroute those to other places yet, um, but it does have MPE, and that's really, really cool. One well, little quirk with it, if you have MPE turned off, it does not respond to polyphonic aftertouch. It only responds to channel aftertouch. So the only way you're going to be able to get a polyphonic aftertouch type of response is using MPE or with an MPE controller. All right, and then there's a four page. So number four sends you to the next page. Uh, saw through uh, and saw through two is whether or not it goes through the MIDI, either from USB or back and so forth. You can restore the initial um, settings from the factory as well. All right, so let's get out of the configure. Takes you back to the preset here. And lastly, we want to go into multi mode. All right. Now the presets, there are 512 presets. It's a lot of memory in here. Um, a lot of slots for memory. A lot of these old style uh, synthesizers don't have a lot of memory or if they have memory at all. So this has a lot of memory associated with it for a lot of different presets. That's really great. And in multi-mode, you have another 128 presets. Okay. Uh, and then you can select your presets of multi-presets in the same way you do with the regular normal preset mode. So if I want the first multi-mode preset, all right, I get a strings preset. This is from the factory, okay? Okay, and you can see from the voices there that it's probably stacked up here. Let me see. All right, and then we go to number two. This is a brass and marimba. Let's see, the marimba is on top, I believe. And then there's a split voice for the brass. So here. They have brass notes. And then you have marimba. So you have a nice uh, split point for there. Okay. A couple other examples here. What else do we have here? We have a nice uh, pad down here and a lead sound. So the multi temporal functions are really, really great for split points, for layers. You can do uh, four-part multi timbral types of things, but there's a couple things to keep in mind. One, it only has seven voices, so you can really load this up pretty quickly. Um, and it also only has one set of outputs, so you can't uh, you know, send it to different places in terms of your mixer. And the chorus and the delay, the effects, are global for the entire synth. So it has some limitations there. I did try to set something up like that. Uh, let's see if we can dial that up here. Two, one, one. All right, so I dialed up one here, called this the multiverse. Now here on the side, I have my Conductive Labs NDLR set up to play this given um, multi-temporal type sound. So let's see how that works out. Okay, that's not going to win any composition awards, uh, but it does give you the idea that you can separately send on different MIDI channels uh, a whole new set of you know arpeggiations or from your DAW or from your sequencer a whole different set of you know sequences and or you know sounds to the different uh, four parts of multi temporality. Um, so that's kind of fun. And uh, just to show you that one more time so you can hear what the different ones were, you heard this one the first time. So 
sort of a droney pad. Then you heard this ARP. <laughs> So that's a totally different sound. And then you heard this sort of bass sound. And then you heard this kind of like percussion hitting occasionally in the background. Okay, now you see that some of them are polyphonically voiced. Some of them are mono voice, so you can set that all up in there. I don't want to bore you with all that right now. Um, it does take a little bit of time to set it up, to pull it all in together, and to set it up for whatever you want. I really do think the, the multi-temporality is better used and better suited for splits and for layers and things like that. Uh, that's really where you're going to get the most power out of it, because basically it only has seven voices. All right, lastly, I want to talk about just how I feel about the synth, the pros and the cons of it. Cons to me are always sort of wish list items. They're not necessarily bad things, but they're things that I hope that can be approved if possible. Let's first talk about the pros. The construction. This is a really well-made synthesizer. I mean, you know, Argentina isn't exactly known for a hotbed of making, you know, great synths. Well, it is now because this is a really nicely well-made synthesizer. The construction is very, very nice. I'm told the interior has surface mounted components um, almost all the way throughout. It's just really nice and it's really well made. A lot of care obviously went into putting this synth together. Um, the sound is really, really nice. It's capable of doing a lot of different sounds. I think it's really, really nice for pad sounds. It's nice for keyboard sounds. If you're a keyboard player, plays a lot of good keyboards, you're going to really like this synth. It's good for bass types of sounds. It's good for leads. Um, it can get nasty, but it's not really necessarily that type of synth. It's got a really kind of uh, quirky sounding filter resonance. Um, so if you like squeechy types of sounds, it really works for that. Um, so it really is a flexible synthesizer, and it truly sounds like an analog polysynth. Um, the price, I mean, the price of the synth is just, you know, amazing for everything that you get. It's uh, 1499 U.S. dollars. Um, really, really a great price. Comparatively to other synths that you might get, you know, in the same range, say from uh, Sequential or from the Black Corporation, this thing is very, very well competitively priced against them for a fully analog polysynth. So that's really, really great. Um, the other thing I really think I, I like a lot is the screen display. It gives you a lot of great visual feedback. It's small, but it gives you all the information that you need. Some of the numbers are really, really small. If you're like me, you're going to have to read the glasses, but you know, at least it's there. That's really, really great. It has CV inputs. You know, that's really, really awesome. A lot of synth companies, you know, they just kind of skip over that, particularly for a polysynth. This has got the CV inputs, so that's really, really great. Um, it has built-in effects with true bypass of the dry analog signal. That's really, really great. Very, very thoughtful. Um, it has audio rate up to 100 hertz LFOs. So you can get some really nasty sounding you know, effects from the LFOs when they're maxed out. Um, it has sync for the LFOs and it has sync for the effects. So that's really great. So you can definitely do external sync to this and really get them to chime in together with your other gear. It has some really awesome tracking modes, tracking modes that you don't really see a lot in a lot of polysynths, particularly like the keyboard type of tracking. Um, you don't really see that a lot. Uh, some of the older roller synths had that. This has that as well. Um, it is four part multi temporal You can get up to that. Okay, there are some limitations of what you can do with that, but it's there and it really adds a lot of dimension to the synth. Um, and lastly, I think the other real positive is the amount of memory that comes with this synth. 512 memory slots just for the presets and another 128 slots for the multis. That's a lot of memory that you don't normally see that much memory, you know, in a poly synth, particularly an old fashioned style poly synth like this. Um, you know, you'd be surprised if you get any memory from some of the makers out there. This has got it. Uh, for, again, a very, very, very attractive price. Now, the cons on this, you know, as I say, cons are always wish list items to me. In and of itself, I take this all day long, just without any improvements. In fact, that's why I bought it. But there are some things I think that could be improved upon, and there are wish list types of items. 
Um, not in any particular order, just things that I ran across as I went. Um, in the polyphonic mode, I wish the envelopes had a legato type of mode. Um, it is all re-triggered, but that's okay. Um, I do wish the CV did have an external uh, clock sync. Um, there's not negative filter tracking, it's only a positive filter tracking. Um, and in fact, you know, the mods and the aftertouch uh, are usually uh, need a bipolar type of effect. Um, so it's either bipolar or uni on either the mod or the destination. It's not both on each one. When you use the shift button, this is something that actually kind of bothers me. It's a little, it takes a little time to get used to. The shift button is a latch. It's either on or off. It's not a monetary like most senses you use. So you like hold it and actually make a change and then let go and it turns off. Okay, so that can be a little bit uh, unnerving at times because if you hit shift and you start doing some changes here and then you forgot to hit shift again and you go elsewhere, you're not really remembering where you are and or you're making changes that you don't want to. So you always have to remember to turn the shift off. And that's not like many other, you know, uh, synthesizers like that. I just wish that you had the ability in the configuration to change that to your preference. There are some cases where the latch works even better than not the latch, particularly in the multi-mode. So I can see why it's there in that way. All right, when you start up the synth, it starts up in panel mode. I kind of wish that you had the option for it to start up in preset mode. And because then you have to switch it all the way back, you know, if you're not going to use panel mode, um, you know, at a gig, most times you're going to use a preset, say for example, it should start up in preset mode. So I do wish it had the configuration to do that. You don't have the ability to do the preset scroll, preset scrolling. You have to actually, you know, type in the preset. Um, the only way you're going to do preset scrolling is if you use a, an external controller. All right, next on my wish list, while it does have MPE, which is absolutely great, you don't usually see that on an analog polysynth, uh, only on the really much more expensive ones, uh, ones that come to mind, say, or the ones that are from Black Corporation that have that. Um, it has it, it's great. Um, but if you don't use the MPE and or you don't have an MPE controller, you only get channel aftertouch, you don't have polyphonic aftertouch. Most of the ones that I've seen that have MPE usually also have polyphonic aftertouch associated with them, so you can use the two different types of controllers. Also, the MPE is hardwired um, to the three different X, Y, and Z planes, as I mentioned before, those being the pitch, the filter, as well as the amplifier. Um, it would be really great if you could route those to something else, say the resonance or the pulse width or something like that. Um, so you can't do that, but again, you know, it has MPE. It's something that, you know, you don't usually see elsewhere. There's no system dump on here. I don't see any way to back up the presets on here. So I don't really see that. If I'm wrong about that, I'd be glad to know it because um, there is no backup system as far as I can tell. Let me see here. There's no screen timeout. You know, after a while, that screen's going to burn out like every other screen that ever was ever made. Uh, there's no timeout for that to try to save the screen. Uh, the knob functions only have one function. If you move a knob, it's going to go to automatically to where it was uh, at its physical uh, location. Um, there's no like knob catch, latch, and relative uh, selections for the knob functions. Um, lastly, it is a brand new. Uh, Polysynth from a relatively new company from Argentina. Argentina isn't known for being, you know, a mecca of uh, synthesizers. I'm really, really glad to see that, you know, a new company from a new place has come out, you know, with something this awesome. I mean, you don't really, really see that. I know that GS Music has made some smaller synthesizers in the past, but this is a big step up for them. Um, there's no warranty or necessarily that is actually stated on their website. I have no uh, issues or beliefs that they won't back up their products. Uh, I've spoken to uh, the designer of the product and, you know, the guy seems to be really, really great. Um, but again, it's not actually applied on there. Such is the case when you're buying boutique synths from anywhere around the world, though. That's a long list of cons that I just mentioned. Again, you know, those are all generally wish list items. It just proves that I really went all the way through the synth to find out the things that, you know, I really wish it would have over and above all the great things that it does have. As it is right now for the money that you get in this, this thing is a tremendous value and it really does sound great and gives you everything you really want in a old fashioned style, you know, analog polysynth. 
All right, so what do I think? I think this is a really awesome synthesizer. It's, you know, an old school style synth. You know, uh, today they're coming out with all kinds of uh, repo, you know, replicant type synthesizers. They're coming out with, uh, you know, clones and, you know, new editions of old editions. Well, this is something new that kind of pays homage to old but it's also its own design so that's really great it does sound really really good it has a lot of really awesome features that you don't find in other synths particularly for something that's at such a great price as this so i'm very excited to have it here in my studio it's going to be sitting right here on this desk for a very long time if you like the videos that i'm doing here please you know subscribe share all that good stuff hit the bell you're going to see a lot more to come i'm probably going to be posting another video uh, when I get some of my own presets made on the GS Music E7. Thanks so much for watching and your support. I'll see you next time.